All right, folks, well, we are about 30 seconds or so away from restarting the release party. Carl, I'm going to go ahead and bring you up here and we'll do the quick uh, AV shakedown before we get started. Hey, hey, hey. Stop can you hear me? I sure can. Let me put this center. This platform has been really easy to use. I like this restraint quite a bit. Oh, uh, so my camera is, does my camera look fuzzy to you too? Let me try something. It it is. It's got the background blur. No, no, it wasn't that. It was just sometimes this camera gets dumb, and I had I like had to make it focus on something up closer, and then it's like, oh yeah, I need to focus. Mm, yeah, does it look better now. Yes, you look clear. Well, all right. Well, we are right at 12 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. for you, sir. Uh, with that. I will go ahead and, oh, uh oh, am I still visible? Everything is frozen in Chrome. Is it just me? I hear you and see you still. Okay. I I can't hear, well, I can hear myself, but I can't see myself in uh, Restream. Hopefully it'll unfreeze here in a minute. So then I can, okay, there we go. Well, with that, Carl, I'm going to go and hand it over to you for an introduction on Apple 10 and what's new in the Apple world with Fedora Linux 40. Over to you. All right. How are y'all doing today? This is a little weird for me. Uh, when I present, I like feeding off the audience energy, and I kind of don't have that now, so I feel like I'm just talking to myself in a room, which is weird, So, but I'll do what I can. Uh, my name's Carl George. Uh, I am the team lead for the Apple team within the Community Platform Engineering Group at Red Hat. Uh, this got my contact info up on the screen. I'm Carl W. George in most places. Uh, I'll have that contact info up on the last slide also if you want it. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Apple 10 overview. Uh, you may be wondering, Apple 10, like uh, RHEL 10 isn't out yet. How could this even be a thing? Well, we're trying to get ready ahead of time. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And we're going to do things a little bit differently for Apple 10. Uh, to better explain that, I really need to uh, look back in history and talk about where where we've come from and what we've done in Apple, Apple 8 and Apple 9 differently uh, to get to what we're going to be doing for Apple 10. So originally, back in the Apple 7 days, Apple would build against, uh, it would just basically be major version only. We'd have package maintainers had an Apple 7 branch. It would be built against the uh, against RHEL 7.0, and then the package disk tag, which is a string that's added at the in the release field of the package, would be .el7 to indicate which you know RHEL release it was built for. It would populate an Apple slash 7 repository. And then about nine months later, after RHEL, RHEL came out, RHEL 7 came out, RHEL 7.1 was released, and we just switched the build route to that immediately. So Apple 7 tracked the latest minor version of RHEL 7 at all times. And then the same thing happened with 7.2 uh, and just continued on throughout time. This effectively made Apple 7 major version only. And this generally worked be just because of the nature of RHEL itself, the major version stability. Um, RHEL is very consistent over its over its major version lifecycle, but there are new features added in minor versions, uh, and sometimes that results that those new features do require library changes that can impact third parties building against RHEL libraries like Apple. Um, so yeah, that means that even though it's very stable, a very stable platform, it's not completely frozen. Uh, and here's one of the, the weird things with my live presenting. I really like asking audience questions to get the interaction. And I would usually ask, um, what do, does anyone know what happened in the RHEL 7.4 release that was big and notable uh, affecting third parties? Um, somebody might raise their hand, but since I don't have that, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, OpenSSL got rebased. Uh, this was pretty disruptive uh, for some people. It, it opened us still got rebased from version 1, 101E to 102K. Um, this actually had pretty good forward compatibility so that packages built against like RHEL 7.3 would keep working on 7.4. But the problem came up that new packages that were uh, built against 7.4 wouldn't work on earlier minor versions. Uh, this included CentOS 7, which at the time CentOS was downstream of RHEL instead of upstream of RHEL. And so uh, CentOS 7, it lagged about, uh, at least for 7.4, it lagged about six weeks behind RHEL 7.4. So there was about a six week window 
where rel was on 7.4, CentOS was on 7.3, and if a package, if an Apple packager rebuilt their package, it would only be compatible on rel and not be compatible on CentOS. Obviously not a good, good, uh, you know, a good setup, but because it was a relatively short amount of time, that six weeks, the uh, general advice was hold off, don't update your packages yet, or update them and leave them in the testing repo and manually push them uh, until CentOS 7.3 caught up also. And that kind of worked. Uh, it was, it's not the best setup, but kind of a, uh, you know, list of compromises that made the most sense with what we had set up at the time. Apple 7 kept going through 7.5, 7.6 and uh, onward. 7.8 had another uh, big disruptive library change uh, that some people noticed. Uh, again, this is where I would ask the audience if anyone knows what it was, but since there's no, I can't see any hands being raised, then I'll just go ahead and tell you. Uh, Rail 7.8 rebased the Image Magic library, um, which has a very long version string, but it was basically from version 6.7 to 6.9. Um, on the release day for Rail 7.8, um, Apple packages, we didn't have that forward compatibility this time uh, with Image Magic. It just changed the library thing. So packages, Apple packages that had been built on 7.7 .7 stopped working on RHEL 7.8 immediately and needed to be rebuilt. But because of the rebuild delay in CentOS, if the Apple packages rebuilt their, their package immediately for the new Image Magic library, then it would fix it for RHEL and then break it for CentOS, which didn't catch up till about four weeks later. So we still had this weird period where things were inconsistent and not a great not a great thing to have to explain to people why it didn't work in one scenario or, or another. Um, but there was no real way to fix this since we were only tar only building against RHEL and only targeting the current minor version. So there's really no way to fix it. And we just kind of ignored the problem and, and you know made excuses for it, which, you know, there was the limitations we had at the time, not, not much we could do about it. Not, uh, not judging anyone involved in how it was set up, just, that was what we learned was that, oh, because of the difference here, this makes it a little bit painful. Um, in current state, Apple 7, uh, we were building against RHEL 7.9, which I believe came out in 2020. And uh, it's it, RHEL 7 itself is in its maintenance phase, and uh, it's getting ready to be retired next month. Um, or rather, ending its maintenance phase, there's some extended stuff from Red Hat, but Apple 7 is going to be end of life with the end of the maintenance phase. So uh, I believe end of June you know, is that when those are getting retired. So now let's talk about Apple 8. We started it the same way as Apple 7. Um, an Apple 8 branch for packagers built against RHEL 8.0. It had an, an EL8 disk tag and it populated a Apple 8 repo. Um, something else notable happened at this time though. This is whenever CentOS Stream launched. Uh, we had CentOS Stream 8. It didn't. It started kind of uh, uh, basically the same as what CentOS Linux 8 was, was uh, but over time it started getting libraries and, and package updates ahead of RHEL. The idea was that we would have CentOS be about a minor version of head of RHEL, and eventually that that uh, that worked out to being CentOS Stream was the upstream for RHEL. It was basically the major version. Um, and it led and package updates would lead rail by about six months as opposed to lagging rail by about a month. Um, Apple continued switch, switch to building against rail 8.1 and 8.2. Uh, around this time, we started noticing that there were a few Apple packages, not very many, uh, that wouldn't install on CentOS Stream 8, uh, mainly because at this time, uh, CentOS already had 8.3 content. Uh, one example was a newer uh, LLVM. Uh, which includes LLVM-lib, which has library SO names that packages build against. Um, that So that gap where library symbols might be different between CentOS and RHEL went from a few weeks to a few months, because instead of being about a month behind RHEL, it was now about four to six months ahead of RHEL. So this longer gap meant that we couldn't really ignore the problem anymore. So we started thinking about ways we could solve this. Um, at the time, I proposed a new idea called Apple Next. Um, my idea was that we, we didn't really need a, an entirely separate Apple for CentOS. Most of the packages, like 99, over 99% 99 of them, work just fine, mainly because of the major version stability of RHEL itself and how close, even, even with the changes to CentOS, how close CentOS Stream and RHEL still were. Uh, but for the, if you had one of those affected packages, less than 1% of them, 
you didn't really care about how close they were. The one thing you cared about didn't work, and so you were mad. Uh, so I tried to come up with a solution to fix that. Uh, Apple Next was that. The idea was that it would be an optional build target for packagers and an optional repo. Uh, CentOS users would add that repo. Rail users would not. And it would just contain packages that were kind of overrides or newer newer version of new, newer releases that would have a compatible build so packagers could target uh, RHEL and CentOS separately when necessary, which isn't wasn't always necessary, just that few few amount of packages. Um, we launched that around RHEL 8.4, and packagers could request uh, an Apple 8-next branch is how we set it up in the in the package source. Um, Apple would still build against RHEL at the time 8.4. Apple 8 Next would build against CentOS Stream 8. The disk tag would be slightly different. It would get a .next suffix. Um, and then it will populate a separate repo path. This actually became immediately useful uh, around this time. We had a, an 8.5 library landing in CentOS Stream 8, which was a, Q, a rebase of QT from 5.12 to 5.15. Um, quite com a re fairly compatible update as far as QT goes, but it did have a different library SO name, so packages needed to be built differently for it. Um, this definitely affect, uh, I know there's a lot of KDE fans and this affected KDE and KDE needed to be rebuilt. Uh, so it basically became immediately useful. KDE was one of the first builds and KDE applications were some of the first builds we put in Apple 8 next uh, to get them working separately on CentOS Stream 8 un for you know the four or five months until those QT changes landed in RHEL 8.5 which is what happened uh, here at this point in time. That prior work in Apple Next provided the blueprint for the rebuilds to be repeated in the main Apple. There was a little bit of build order things that had to be worked out. Um, a little bit of a downside I'll get into more later, but it did. we couldn't just inherit the builds directly. We had to do repeat all of those builds. And I'll talk more about those in a future slide. Um, but Apple 8 Next itself, the way it was set up, um, we set up as, it was kind of a bolt-on solution to the existing um, infrastructure and workflows for Apple 8, and it it mostly worked. It helped with future rebases of Qt, LLVM, and other libraries in RHEL. Um, so it solved that basic problem. We're moving on through 8.7 and 8.8. Um, Apple 8 Next continued to build just build against CentOS Stream 8, while Apple 8 kept going through the minor versions of RHEL, just like Apple 7 had previously. This allowed packagers to target both RHEL and CentOS Stream simultaneously. Um, and we were able to implement it without disturbing existing workflows. So if you didn't know about Apple, Apple Next, you could kind of just ignore it. Um, ideally, maintainers wouldn't ignore it because if they got a bug report that a package didn't work on CentOS Stream, we wanted them to use Apple Next to solve it. Uh, so ideally not ignoring it completely, but you could uh, ignore it until you found, got a bug report that something wasn't working correctly. So if you never got one of those bug reports, you could just ignore its existence entirely and just keep using Apple the way you had before in the past. Um, here's where we're at now. RHEL 8.10 just got released. Um, CentOS Stream 8's going into life at the end of the month, corresponding to the RHEL uh, full support phase. And then we're also going to retire, because there's no longer a maintained build route, we're going to retire Apple 8 next at the same time. So... For Apple 9, we started thinking about this. We knew that uh, we knew Apple 8 lagged behind on packages for a variety of reasons that honestly could be it's an entirely entirely own talk that I could go into. Um, but thoughts of, uh, we started thinking about ways we can make Apple 9 better. A lot of it just boiled down to we need to get more packages in faster, and how do we do that? Just doing those packages ourselves isn't. Uh, this is around, also around the time we started the Apple team inside CPE, uh, and we were thinking, you know, at first, it was just me. We later added another person, and now we have a third person temporarily. And we knew that just having you know a, a handful of people adding packages isn't a really scalable solution. So we started thinking, how could we do this in a better way? Uh, if you want to know more about that whole history, uh, I have a talk that's been recorded a few times called The Road to Apple 9. If you look that up on YouTube, uh, you can find out more of the details about how we did that. I'm going to give you the real high Cliff Notes version here. Um, we basically, we, the end result was that we launched Apple 9 about six months before RHEL 9 uh, because we set it up initially building against CentOS Stream 9. Um, the, at the time we were saying, you know, CentOS had, was reflecting 9.0 content about six months before it's actually released in RHEL and uh, it, it worked. We were able to build packages. It gave maintainers extra time to get their, their stuff built early and uh, get a lot of packages accumulated in the repository 
in time for the actual RHEL 9 release. Uh, RHEL 9.0 came out. We switched Apple 9 to build against that to work like old previous Apple releases. We also added Apple 9 Next to continue build, you know, give maintainers an option to build against CentOS Stream 9 when they needed to. And we set that up the same way Apple 8 and Apple 8 Next uh, worked. So we just rearranged things. Uh, we made this a transparent switch for maintainers and users, uh, kind of similar to how you know Apple 8 would move from RHEL you know, 8.8 .8 to 8.9 and so on. Uh, we wanted a similar transition here, and it worked pretty well. We didn't get any, any complaints or bug reports about this. Uh, and the end result was that it gave us about 5,700 RPMs uh, in, available in Apple 9 from about 2,600 source RPMs for the packagers that care about that level of nuance um, available at the RHEL 9 launch, which is something we'd never done before having that many packages. Uh, Apple 9 continued on as expected. We switched it from 9.0 to 9.1 and on through all of the minor versions. Um, here's the current state we're at now. RHEL 9.4 came out very recently. Um, but we're think, thinking about this, we realized, you know, there are drawbacks to Apple Next uh, as a bolted on solution to the existing Apple workflows. Um, one thing we notice is that despite us telling people, you know, this is not a, a complete different Apple for CentOS, this is, you know, just a packet, just a repo for override packages, basically. A lot of maintainers don't understand that aspect and they just treat it as a standalone repo. I, I've seen lots of maintainers build for both Apple and Apple Next simultaneously when there's no library difference in the dependencies of that package. So it's just an extra build for no reason. Um, when to use Apple Next became a decision process for maintainers. They had to think about, you know, think about their dependencies, think about and check which ones, if any, were different between CentOS and RHEL. Um, we also, I also mentioned, touched on briefly earlier, there was no inheritance from an Apple Next build to Apple. So every time, uh, when maintainers had to do a rebuild, they had to do it first in CentOS, first in Apple Next against CentOS, and then about six months later, uh, in RHEL or in Apple built against RHEL. So having to do uh, do rebuilds twice wasn't isn't really a great maintainer experience. Um, and the fact that it was optional, I mentioned that maintainers could kind of ignore it, you know, unless they got a bug report about it. Sometimes they still ignored that bug report, and being optional meant that CentOS users had a worse experience which I, I wasn't really a fan of, uh, even though it's my fault, I set it up. <laughs> Apple 9 kept going. We had Apple 9.5, uh, or sorry, RHEL 9.5 and 9.6 and so on. Uh, it'll RHEL, Apple 9 will get to the end of its life cycle uh, at the same time as uh, when RHEL, um, at the end of, sorry, RHEL 9.10 will come out. That'll be the CentOS Stream 9 end of life. And that'll be when Apple 9 Next is retired. Apple 9 won't be retired until five years after that when RHEL 9 itself is retired. Or sorry, not retired, when it reaches the end of its maintenance phase, the main life cycle, it's in, end of its 10 years. So thinking about those drawbacks in Apple, Apple Next, I started thinking, how could we do things better for 10 and look to Fedora for, for inspiration? Uh, Apple, package, Apple is part of Fedora, if you didn't know. Apple packagers are Fedora packagers. And so I wanted to have a workflow that Fedora that was natural for Fedora packagers that wouldn't require as much explanation as what we had in Apple Next. So looking at the way that, you know, in a similar chart style, the way that Fedora branching works, this is the current state right now. Uh, we've got a F39, F40, and a Rawhide branch for the package sources. Uh, they're built against the corresponding releases. Um, Notable in the Rawhide branch that when it's built against Fedora Rawhide, it actually gets an FC41 disk tag. And that's because Rawhide reflects the net, the content that's going to be in the next release of Fedora. And if that sounds simple, that's that should sound similar if you've been paying attention to what we, I've been saying about CentOS Stream, and is that it reflects the content going into the next RHEL minor version. That's foreshadowing for how we how we landed on setting up Apple 10. All right. uh, in the in the you know near in the near future, probably about six months, uh, Fedora. Well, before that, Fedora 41 will branch and then it will we'll get released. Uh, Rawhide at that time will get bumped up to an FC 42 disk tag, uh, and that's whenever Rawhide is going to be eligible to start getting you know Fedora 42 content. Uh, and then shortly while at, shortly after that is when the Fedora 39 end of life will happen. Um, this lets maintainers focus in the leading branch uh, and only making and they can make changes in the older branches when it's necessary or appropriate. 
Um, there are rules around what updates you can do in each branch if you want to look at the Fedora update policy. Um, but a really key thing that I liked about this is that builds that are done in the leading in Rawhide in the leading branch, uh, if you don't do anything else, they're just inherited into the next release. That was something really important that I thought we we would benefit from in Apple. So, what what we've learned as far as Apple Ten, Rel has uh, in preparation for Apple Ten, Rel has minor versions. Apple Seven ignored this entirely. Apple Eight and Apple Nine couldn't completely ignore it because of CentOS Stream. Um, Apple Next is a partial fix, but it's less than ideal. Uh, the path forward, I think, is to fully embrace minor versions in Apple Ten. Apple and Apple Next let us target. Uh, the realization here was that Apple Next and Apple basically let us target two minor versions of RHEL at a time, but in a kind of a, an opaque way. So fully embracing the minor version uh, and making it more transparent, I think, is the way forward. So here's what we're looking at for the actual setup. We'll launch it similar to Apple 9. Apple 10 will be built against CentOS Stream 10. The main difference is that uh, the disk tag, instead of just being .el10, will have the minor version indicated there with an underscore zero. Uh, it'll still populate the Apple 10 repo, though. And then later, when RHEL 10 actually comes out, instead of switching Apple 10 to that, we're actually going to create an Apple 10.0 repo and have corresponding 10.0 branches in, in the package source. Um, and then... The Apple 10 builds against the Apple 10 branch, they'll start getting a disk tag of 10 underscore one, similar to how Rawhide gets its disk tag bumped ahead of time. Um, and the key thing there is we're going to have builds that were previously done against CentOS Stream with a 10 underscore zero disk tag. We're going to have them inherited into the 10.0 repo as soon as it's created. So we'll have build inheritance, similar to how a Rawhide build can be inherited into the next Fedora release. Uh, this is, oh, and we'll have the same thing, ha the same pattern happen with 10.1. Uh, RHEL 10.1 will come out. We'll, we'll create a 10.1 branch and repo. Uh, Apple 10 will switch to 10 underscore uh, 2. And then the 10.0 branch will be retired. Um, so we're still only going to target two minor releases at a time. Uh, we're just going to put CentOS Stream front and center, kind of like how it is for RHEL maintainers themselves. This should be an intuitive st structure for Fedora maintainers. Uh, the inherited builds will reduce the rebuild work. There won't be any branching decisions around Apple Next. Uh, we'll, those builds will just be created automatically. Um, this should result in fewer uninstallable packages. It'll give us per minor version archive repos. We sort of have that now, but it's a manual process. This should give us a lot more consistent archives of each minor version. And then we'll also be able to do per minor version retirement. Uh, right now, if a package is going to be added to RHEL, it shows up in CentOS Stream first, and then we kind of break our own rules by not retiring it in, in Apple while it's conflicting with CentOS Stream. We don't retire it until it lands in RHEL, um, which is not a great state. It's one of the drawbacks of the way we have stuff set up with Apple Next. Uh, in this scenario, we, in, for Apple 10, we'll be able to actually retire it in, say, the Apple 10 branch and then not retire the Apple 10.1 branch, but then never create a 10.2 branch if it was indeed added to RHEL. So the per, per minor version retirement will be a big advantage. Uh, Apple 10 will keep going on through the minor versions and just keep swapping over time. I'm, I mentioned that we're going to retire the, you know, the third, the second older branch. Um, eventually, in the future, I would like to have the discussion about whether or not it makes sense to keep the, keep the Apple branches that correspond to real EUS releases active longer. Uh, I know that there's some demand for uh, people using older minor versions of RHEL, those EU extended update support releases, there's some demand for them to have Apple. Uh, and right now our answer is just go use the archive snapshots, but by the way, they're unmaintained and frozen and no security updates. Um, the counter argument to doing that would be that that's more Apple branches and some maintainers might feel like we're asking them to do maintenance for a longer amount of time. The reality is everything in Apple is volunteer basis. No one can make you do anything in Apple. Um, but giving maintainers the option, I think, would be a good discussion to have. But at least for the initial rollout, we're going to keep things simple and just target the two minor versions, the leading minor version in CentOS Stream and the current RHEL minor version. We'll keep going through all the minor versions through time. Uh, and then way far in the future, we'll, the RHEL 10.10 .10 release will come out. Uh, this will be the same time that CentOS Stream 10 is end of life. Um, we'll, instead of creating a 10.10 .10 branch at this point, 
what I think we'll do is just switch the Apple 10 builds to build against rel 10.10. And then we'll update Apple release to switch rel users from the 10 dot minor repo to just the 10 repo, which at that point will have basically coalesced and been the, and be the same as it gets closer to the end of uh, CentOS stream 10 lifecycle. So call to action. Uh, this plan has been approved by the Apple steering committee. Early versions of this talk, it was just me saying, here's what I want to do. Tell me what you think. Um, but this, you know, we've, we've already hammered this out, hammered out lots of details and decided, yes, this is the way we're going to go with it. Uh, various infrastructure pieces are already in progress or, uh, a few pieces are done, like the package signing key. And, uh, we've got sent to a stream 10 mirror, the early composes mirrored into, uh, Fedora infrastructure. So we're going to get started building, uh, setting up some Koji targets and staging and other things like that. Uh, so lots of moving pieces to this. Uh, if you're curious about how you can get involved in helping this effort, uh, we have Apple office hours that are on the Fedora calendar. Um, I think it's the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, we also have a steering committee meeting every week on Wednesday in Matrix uh, that you could attend or just the regular Apple Matrix channel to ask questions. Uh, timing wise, our goal is to uh, kind of launch and announce Apple 10 around November, December this year. Uh, possibly doing a soft launch earlier. And by soft launch, I mean having all the pieces in place and available. And if, uh, you know, an active maintainer notices it's there, they could build against it, but not, you know, shining a light on it to the wider audience until a few of those early, uh, early eager packagers have put a few packages in there. Some of the first blowback we had when we announced Apple 9 was, oh my God, how could you call Apple 9 launched? It doesn't have these packages I care about. But there's not a specific content set for Apple. It's always, you know, build it and they will come. Um, if there's something you want to see in Apple, you should file a bug and ask for it or get involved and package it yourself. So hopefully with the soft launch, we can get a, a little bit of content in there before we actually do a proper announcement. Uh, speaking of the Apple Steering Committee, uh, I am not above a shameless plug. Uh, we are switching the Apple Steering Committee seats from appointed seats to elected seats. About half the committee, including myself, have volunteered to step down and have the seats filled in the election. Uh, so if if I've ever helped you with something about Apple or you like what I've talked about here today, uh, please consider voting for me. Uh, I'm effectively running for re-election because I'm on the steering committee now. <laughs> and that is uh, all of my stuff. And it looks like I'm right, around, right about 25 minutes. Uh, I have not looked at Matrix at all, so I don't know what any of the questions are. So now it's time to look at that. Yeah, we've got two questions here for you in the thread. Well, actually, well, now three. Um, but we'll go in the order. They're almost in sequential order with the number of votes. So we'll start with the first of our three questions, which is what is the current status of involvement with non-rel downstreams, such as Alma, Rocky, and Oracle with Apple 10? None so far. We're still really early though. So I don't I wouldn't really hold it against them. Um uh, some of the stuff still in discussion phase. I have I have noticed that there have been uh, there's someone from the infrastructure team of both Rocky and Alma that have uh, participated in some of the discussions around Apple 10, uh, but not any of the work yet. But like I said, it is still really early, so I wouldn't uh, wouldn't make too many judgments from that. Uh, Oracle, I don't know anyone over there, and they don't really engage with us, so I don't know. <laughs> The second question we have here is, will these branch and dist tag changes require RHEL system administrators to take any actions when new minor releases come out? So ideally for the users, uh, so uh, RHEL system administrators like the consumers of Apple, uh, they won't have to take any action. They'll have, they'll install an Apple release package like they always have. And um, there's actually some neat changes that, uh, uh, Neil Gompa worked to get into DNF, uh, originally into DNF5, and then whenever DNF5 got delayed, uh, or not delayed, deferred to a future Fedora release, it became clear that RHEL 10 was going to have DNF4 still. Uh, those changes got backported from DNF5 to DNF4. Uh, currently, there's re the release ver DNF variable. That's just the major version of the OS. And um, uh, Neil worked with the upstream to actually get major and minor equivalents of that. So release for underscore major and release for underscore minor. So those will be native to DNF and DNF will understand them. And we're going to use those variables in the uh, in the base URL or in the Metalink URL to point users at the right repo. So when you update, you know, once your Red Hat release package or CentOS release package gets updated, 
uh, you should just be pointing at the right repository based on the, the properties of your system without any manual interaction. Excellent. At least that's our intent. We'll see see how well it works. Yeah, and this will probably be, this is this is our last question, and we'll probably be the only question we will still have time for. Uh, what will be the implementation command? Sudo DNF install link to the Apple 10 RPM package. Does it have to be re-implemented after minor point releases in CentOS Stream and RHEL? I mean, replace 10 with 10.1, for example. So that was uh, that's kind of similar to the previous question, um, but elaborating a little more. Uh, before we had the release for major minor stuff added, or or rather, when that was just a request and wasn't implemented yet, and we didn't know if it would be implemented in time, we were planning out ways that we would be able to do that. Uh, say with updates to the Apple release package, putting uh, you know putting the minor version in the version for that, and figuring out way thinking about thinking through ways to make that transition happen. However. Because we got those variables implemented in DNF directly, uh, now that shouldn't be necessary. You should just that command, that example command right there. That's exactly what I want to work. You'll install the the current Apple release package, and then based on the, what minor version you're on, you should get the appropriate repository. Even for older minor versions, even if we don't actually keep branches alive longer for EUS style maintenance of Apple branches, um, we should be able to set it up in Mirror Manager, kind of like how. Archive Fedora releases keep our stay active and available, but point to uh, mirrors that are that are mirroring the Fedora archive instead of the current Fedora releases. We should be able to set up something similar. So even if you're on an older rel rel release, you can install the latest Apple release package. It'll understand the state of your system, what minor version you're on, and either point you to the current ones on the mirror or the, uh, through the mirror network some of the archive re repos of the old old minor version that corresponds to the one you're on. Excellent. Well, Carl, that brings us pretty much right to the end of the slot. Thanks so much for the overview on everything that is new in Apple 10. And uh, people, and, and thanks to the folks in the chat, they shared links to all the Apple channels and places to discuss too. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Carl. Enjoy the rest of the party.